Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Because you're a part of the Bike Club, you can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial by going to audibletrial.com slash bite that. This helps out with the show, and you can get to choose from over 180,000 titles, which include plenty of wrestling audiobooks. Not bad. Hey, Bike Club, what is going on? Welcome to episode 194 of the Bite That Weekly Wrestling Podcast, available every single Wednesday. Now we cover the latest happenings inside of the WWE. We're going to be talking about Raw, SmackDown Live. We're on the road to Backlash. Jinder continues to be on the main event scene. How are we feeling about it? How are we feeling about the fact that Rusev continues to pop up on our screens talking about money in the bank and the possible title contention? We are going to be discussing that as well. And I don't want to waste any more of your time because we do got to thank our lovely, lovely Patreons. If you want to support us for as little as $1 a month, you can get access to a video version of the show. This helps cover production. You also get behind the scenes look. You can watch me mess up. You can watch our lovely, lovely mugs as well. And some of the people that have become Patreons include... Alex Servino, Dominic Diaz, and Paul Loban. Head on over to patreon.com slash bite that for all the information to support us, as well as bite that.com for EC access links, including for a one time donation link. My name is Juan Velos. I am from San Juan, Puerto Rico. I'm back. I was at Washington, D.C. last week. Welcome back, sir. Thank you, sir. I, I met Michael Phelps. I was on NBC talking about mental health and a couple of people. I want to thank the bike club right off the bat. A couple of people were there. You know, uh, they attended some of the uh, the live events. I got some DMs. So seriously, it's great to see that we can get like not just wrestling fans, but we really are building a community. And by the way, that's Ryan McNulty from Boston Mass talking. Hello. Hello. No Keith this week. So we're sort of back to the the faithful tradition that when one of us misses the show, the other one sort of leaves for a while, but then Ryan's here. Cause, I'm cause always you're, here. You're here. I'm the constant of Bite That. Whether you like it or not, I'm sticking around. We're about two weeks away from Backlash, so I'd say now we're finally getting back to the regular tradition of WWE programming where there's a lot more pay-per-views happening. You know, it was there was that, that lull in a good way. I like the lull of there was WrestleMania way back there. We had payback, but now it's like, yeah, week after week almost, we're going to get a pay-per-view. Uh, I do want to immediately jump to the uh, polls that we put up every single week over at twitter.com slash cast, getting your feedback about what happened on Raw SmackDown and your enjoyment. First of all, uh, first up, when we talk about Raw, we saw that 50%, so the exact half of the people that voted, give it two out of four with meh. And then when I scroll up, because I am scrolling up as I do this right now, to hear a 45% gave it a 3 out of 4 for SmackDown Live. So, you know, this always seems to be happening. It's almost like a, just the tradition that SmackDown generally does way better than Raw. I think that this this week was, I don't know if it's, like, I, I watched some of the wrestling last week, but because I was traveling, I was packing stuff up, I didn't really have a chance to really just sit down and enjoy it. With Raw, I like some things, but I still feel the way I did like two weeks ago, and I want to get your thoughts on that. We're waiting for something to happen. It feels like there's something like just around the corner. I don't know if it's with Finn Balor. You know, Braun Strowman got injured, so we're going to be talking about that soon. Maybe that's the reason why Like we're getting like a, a little bit of stalling. How do you feel now that we're about, about a month off after the uh, shakeup? I'm feeling a similar feeling of... You're like, what the heck's going on? It doesn't feel like a lot's happening. That can partly be attributed to the fact, and no offense to the UK audience, but anytime I see that we have, not the UK, yeah, I mean, when they take Careful, careful, I'm, I'm show, the guy no, that I, gets it wrong. The UK audience is one of the best crowds, don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is, when I see that Raw and SmackDown is going to be taped uh, in the UK, it's usually like, oh, it's going to be a taped show. Usually nothing crazy happens. They just kind of play it like they do a by the numbers Monday Night Raw. Kurt Angle wasn't even there. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of people who don't even end up traveling over overseas. 
So that's the part where it's usually when I see it's going to be uh, a Raw and a SmackDown in in the UK, it's generally a kind of a disappointing show. And I, I didn't think anything spectacular happened this week. It was just kind of a run of the mill week. Uh, nothing, nothing too crazy. There were, there were obviously some highlights on both shows, but for the most part, you know, there's not that big thing this week that we're all talking about, you know, except for maybe what happened that doesn't really have to do with storyline, but Strowman, you know, like overall, and, and this is, uh, definitely to the, the positivity of SmackDown live. I had fun watching SmackDown live. Like I watched half of it. Uh, sort of driving uh, like I listened to a good portion of it then I rewatched it because I arrived home late from work but I made sure to catch up on everything that happened and from you know the fashion files which everybody knows I love Johnny Curtis I love Fandango and the damn week that I got to travel is when the the fashion files start happening and I I freaking love law and order this is everything you wanted rolled yes, into man. one yes man like nicole and i consistently watch like 24 hour law and order marathon so i'm yelling at my screen going why can i not talk about this on the podcast so i'm really happy it wasn't a one-time thing but let's just sort of go back to what you mentioned here braun Strowman. he's not the only guy to get injured by the way we still have dash wilder who's a who's a couple of weeks out Apparently, Ember Moon in NXT is out of action. I don't know if it's storyline related or not. There's a couple of other people in NXT, so it it goes with the territory. At this point, it's not even breaking news when somebody in NXT or WWE gets injured. But with Braun Strowman, it's this interesting situation, right, where the monster among men is still a human being, right? So he's going to be out of action for like six to eight weeks, which is not a big deal. Do you think this is a blessing more so than a curse? Because a lot of times this helps avoid certain outcomes for matches that maybe happen along the way. This is a hundred percent a curse. I mean, Braun Strowman was on the run of a lifetime. He had so much momentum, and now he's going to get hurt. He was rumored to be the guy who was going to face Brock Lesnar at Great Balls of Fire. Oh. Which is a real pay per view name, by the way, that we made sure not to Another ignore. Thing last I didn't week. get to talk about. Yeah, so that that was seemed like that was the plan for Strowman that he would possibly beat Roman Reigns at Extreme Rules, which is coming up, and then would face Brock Lesnar at the next Raw pay per view. And now all of that seems like it could potentially be in jeopardy. Like, what the hell are they going to do with Roman Reigns now? That they kind of just played it off like. Reigns injured Strowman, so he's going to be away for a while. Which was so smart. Reigns, Reigns is rumored to now be feuding with Bray Wyatt, so yay, we get we get to revisit that again potentially. Oh boy! For the love of God, please no. But what I'm saying is, obviously Finn Balor went away for a lot longer when he got hurt. But it really, you know, sometimes I say, oh, when you're away for a while and then you come back, it's this big thing. But it's like Finn Balor, man does not feel like he's he's getting that momentum back and that's what i'm afraid of with braun Strowman. is it seems like so many people they're like they're on this really big run and they're right about to to make it and then something like this happens and it's happening time after time like especially around wrestlemania you know you know you look at dan o'brien you look at finn balor you don't even need to make a list of four guys because like just those two guys alone can shift right like it's easy to forget Finn Balor was your first universal champion, but then it feels like this this mythical thing that happened at some point and nobody remembers. But with Braun Strowman, I was trying to be be positive, but I guess because New Day moved on over to SmackDown Live, the power of positivity is not really on Raw. He is the monster. I can't say monster. Monster. Mon- monster. I keep saying Mon. like mung. Mon. Mung. Like think Come like on, Pokemon. Man. Yeah. Pokemon monster among men. That okay, the among is why I keep getting tongue tied there. So you're you're becoming a human by doing that, right? It's the same thing as if people like Bray Wyatt and Luke Harper and Eric Rowan at the time get injured. The the perception of this like supernatural monster becomes like broken. And then, like, I, I appreciated how he was open, like, when I come back, you know, I want Brock Lesnar, I want the Beast. But what's going to happen between them? I think it doesn't take a lot. You just destroy somebody. I do at least appreciate that he was physically involved on Raw. It wasn't just like, I'm injured. Because we've already seen him walk out on multiple occasions, right, with Undertaker, etc. 
So like l- linking those two things together could have been really bad. So I at least applaud and uh, WWE at this attempt. And also like he almost got a chair shot to the back of the head from Reigns on Raw. Did you notice that? I, I, didn't, I didn't notice it, but obviously that that's a little bit of a concern. But they needed to find a way to write him off. And yeah, I know what you mean. It kind of kills the image when you have to write him off. But like literally what the hell else are you supposed to do? Yeah, it's better to at least do that. So when he comes back, he has he has a reason to go after Reigns again. But at the same time, what does this mean for his his image as a monster when you're you know, you got you're in a sling. You know what I mean? He can come back and he's got to get some kind of revenge on Reigns, which I'm hoping happens on Raw, because if they do it on a pay-per-view, he's not beating Reigns again. That is that is not any kind of option. And I think that he was going to lose to Brock Lesnar. I don't think anybody thinks otherwise. That's fine. Brock Lesnar is meant to destroy everybody. Like losing to Brock Lesnar is not a bad thing. Like when a Kofi Kingston got destroyed at Beast in the East, I think it was, he was proud. He was proud on Raw the fact that I got to survive Brock Lesnar. And that's really what should matter at the end you of the day, right? You would hope that Strowman, it would be sort of one of those like respect match things where Strowman would actually get close to beating Lesnar or something like that. It would have been huge for him. Just him and Brock main eventing a pay-per-view, that's easily the biggest match of his entire career. And that's a big step for him to headline a pay-per-view with a guy like Lesnar. Granted, he already, he just headlined a pay-per-view with um with Roman Reigns but this is like a title match headlining deal which would be a huge step for him now sort of going back a little bit you mentioned that when these shows are pre-taped some things get shorthanded and that Kurt Angle thing I'm gonna say two things number one I think it's fine for like GMs to take a break every now and then it avoids oversaturation I even tweeted about that where you know we always get Kurt Angle you suck chance that's great and to this moment I'm still super happy, way happier than Mick Foley when he was a GM, right, with what's happening. I do mm-hmm. find it odd that, okay, you're going to have a little bit of fun with, you know, The Miz and Dean Ambrose, but I love how just casually it's like this phone thing. I'm making big announcements, and I think it, it was a big deal. Like, if I'm a GM, let's I know wrestling is scripted, everybody, but hypothetically, say it's real, it's a big freaking deal that one of your top guys is injured and you couldn't even fly out then. So it feels weird that you can even record like on your phone, do something like quote unquote backstage where Kurt Angle's talking about Braun Strowman instead of, hey, Dean, you're on charge. The Miz is in charge. Make make matches, but you're a, you're a champion. So that's kind of awkward. How did you feel about that? I, I just the tone was all over the place for me. Well, the thing is, just like in the context of of the show we're just used to blindly accepting things that don't make sense but that's why i actually wanted to bring up um a review from cage side seats because uh gene gene morosco who i've read his raw reviews in the past he uh he has the right attitude here so i'm gonna read what he wrote in his review because it pretty much perfectly describes uh what you should be thinking when this whole thing goes on so he says WWE occasionally presents stories that make me question my very concept of pro wrestling and my fandom within it. Why am I here? Why are you? Why is this acceptable to me, to to WWE, to anyone? If WWE offers a story so dumb, so destructive to the very basic of logic, the very basics of logic and reasoning, how can I possibly enjoy it? But then you could argue that perfectly describes pro wrestling itself. So the crisis at hand was created by Dean Ambrose and The Miz as co-general managers for Night. Storyline of this week's episode on Raw. So the idea that general manager Kurt Angle, who couldn't be there for the evening, would call Ambrose just as the show was going on the air to tell him he was running it doesn't work in any world other than fantasy. We're to presume that he booked the entire show and worked out all the details of it backstage in between appearances and all, but wait. Here's The Miz bringing word that Stephen McMahon has declared he will be co-general manager to balance things out. He provided zero proof of this and everyone just blindly accepted it. Not, no one questioned anything about this arrangement. There's so much wrong with this picture, literally nothing about it makes sense. There is no logic that dictates Angle should make Ambrose GM for the night. None that supports Stephanie's decision to counter with The Miz. 
None that support the idea that anyone should believe either of these two in the first place, and again, no one questioned it. WWE often fails to create stories that include characters acting in ways that would look natural if they occurred outside of this fantasy world we're supposed to accept as reality. And I, I guess I gotta sort of bring up the fashion police, like the fashion files on SmackDown for not, e not even such a counterpoint, but there is a way you can dispense your belief in wrestling and have it be both serious when you want it to be, you know, and you can also have it be uh, fun and crazy. Like the fashion police, the fashion files, the moment that there's a graphic introducing that, you know that they're doing something for fun, right? It's like, yeah. here we go. It's a, it's a slight break. And they're having fun. They're including people, but they're developing characters. With Raw, the GM is supposed to be this authority figure. So whatever they do, I'm supposed to be like, this is this is the person that can strip someone of a championship. This is the person that can make a WrestleMania match, number one contender. So I cannot take that lightly. So whenever things like that happen, where it's like, The Miz says, Stephanie made me this. And then uh, Kurt Angle made me this. So... Why is nobody questioning it? So I completely get that. And it doesn't take 30 minutes of dialogue. It can just say, you know what? Like, here, here's proof. Like, uh, here's a tweet. They yeah, tweet Kurt all Angle, the time. Yeah. Kurt Angle sends a memo or something. Everyone gets it. There's little, little things that they could do that would just make stories work so much better. But it, it just goes back to things like the Superstar Shakeup where... People just started showing up on the other shows and n not even the GMs knew were they making choices or what was going on. No one knows who actually decided was it up to the wrestler if they wanted to go to the other show. We still don't know. It's it's things like that where it's like just give us a little bit of an explanation. Give us a little bit of world building to let us understand the reality we're supposed to be accepting but in actuality, pro wrestling is this false reality where the rules are constantly changed so that we can move the story along. It almost felt as if Kurt Angle is just not going to show up. We got to make it work. And I want to bring up extreme examples, but uh, the Fast and the Furious movies when, you know, the actor passed away, like the last scenes of the movie were not filmed, right? So they needed to get creative. So they got his brother and uh, his brother, you know, they had like back shots of him because obviously the face isn't exactly like. And when you were watching that movie, you knew something happened. You know, the actor passed away, but they were trying to justify. And even then you could tell with wrestling, you can make anything up. Kurt Angle is alive. So that's what I'm saying. You can just record a little video. Hell, you got Rusev on SmackDown freaking sending videos asking for title shots at a pay-per-view that has. We still have a pay-per-view in between. So it's just, it's not too difficult. It dispenses my belief in the GM role. Like the GM role really is about just when can I beat this Kurt guy Angle up? doesn't provide a reason why he chose Dean Ambrose. They could have easily said, because obviously if Kurt Angle is supposed to be this responsible, you know, GM, he probably would have picked someone different. But if he wanted to go with Ambrose, he could be like, I've decided because Dean Ambrose is technically the top champion who shows up to Monday Night Raw, that is why he is the GM. That's all you have to do. And Stephanie, I like how Stephanie does the counter co-GM when she could just make, you know, overstep Kurt Angle's decision and just make Miz the GM. And why does there have to be a co-GM except for the point of, hey, we're writing Monday Night Raw tonight. I think it'd be really funny if we had The Miz and Dean Ambrose as co-GMs. So that's what we're going to do. Yep. And screw screw how we get there. That's just what's happening because it's funny. There's no actual logic behind why that situation actually occurred. Yeah, so just to clarify, we're not complaining about the fact that it happened. It's that the logic behind it, even from a wrestling standpoint, from Kurt Angle, who is the Olympic gold medalist, who's a former bona, bona fide WWE champion, it just didn't make any sense. Like you mentioned perfectly, it's, have them like have fun we with these two do. guys. We don't care what logical leaps we have to do to get there. We just want to get there. Screw everything else. Yep. That is their mentality. But it is what it is, right? So if anybody had a problem with that, we'd love to know. Just uh, hit us up on Twitter, bite that cast. Now, another thing that did happen 
And it, it's funny because uh, we got these this video. I don't know if you saw it on Twitter with like Alexa Bliss, Nia Jax, Titus O'Neil, The Miz, Maurice just sort of dancing. They, they were having yeah, I did fun. See that. that was awesome. I, I really enjoyed watching that. And I like this pairing of Nia Jax and Alexa Bliss because we all felt it coming. We we felt that this would happen eventually, right? But it's fine. I, I think like the on contrary to what we just talked about, here's something that was expected. I'm looking forward to it because number one, Alexa Bliss, great character. Like her ex- facial expressions, you know, just everything about her is so great. And the fact that she is so short, she is only five foot tall, and you can't teach that. And then you have Nia Jax on the opposite side of the fence, completely towering over her. So David and Goliath, that match is going to happen at some point. But until now, we get to see a different side of Nia, finally. Because like the whole like dominating force thing doesn't work. But the dominating force, until I get to destroy you, is a fun story, right? Like I can snap you like a twig, but until then, we're just going to hang out and have fun. That's a really good story. Like... The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Alexa Bliss knows that sooner or later she's going to get destroyed by Naya. But until now, let's go to Disney. Let's have an awesome time. I love that. Uh, what about you? So, yeah, just the image of when you saw Alexa Bliss come out with Naya Jax, I thought it's perfect. You know, Alexa Bliss is obviously this great competitor, but if she wants to completely dominate the division, she's going to need a muscle, someone like an enforcer type. And Nia Jax obviously works perfectly with that. And I like the setup that it's Nia wants the title shot. So she's going to hang out with Alexa Bliss and stick around, stick close by her until it's her opportunity. But you know what's going to happen is eventually... The, the waters are going to get muddied and she's going to kind of forget about that. She's going to be staying as the enforcer for a while. And then eventually when she realizes she's not going to get the title shot until she takes matters into her own hands, then they feud against each other and boom, there you go. So it, it's really the story sells itself. It, it's going to you already know how it's going to pl- pan out, but I think it's going to be great for both of them. Yeah, I'm looking forward to what's happening here. Maybe we finally, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, get to see a different side of Nia Jax. And I think it's fine for her to embrace the the cool person. You look at her on social media, she is super likable. And honestly, it makes it very hard for me to dislike the character uh, or, or dislike anything that she does on TV because she seems like an awesome person on Instagram and, and pretty much everything else. So just a uh, last little quick thing about Raw. We had this uh, tag team turmoil. Uh, Golden Truth is alive, you know? It's crazy yeah. how, how they're doing things. And they really did a good job, I think, of like incorporating Golden Truth to what's happening. I guess they're trying to finally really rebuild the tag team division on Raw. Do you see it shaping up into a really ball of awesomeness? Or a fire. This this is reminiscent to me of what they did with Rhino and Heat Slater when SmackDown Live first started, in that they're gonna become like the feel good win tag team. So I like they're they're kind of planting the seeds now, but you don't want to just give them the win right away. You want them to really you want the crowd to get invested and really want to see it before it actually happens. And yeah, it's just like a a heartfelt story of. You know, let's see these guys, you know, go get one more run because they really kind of just got cut off when they were were just getting started. Both of these guys are super entertaining. They're really talented. And like Goldust, it's such a I feel like it's such a waste to have Goldust on the roster. This, you know, this guy is a vet. He's been wrestling for what? Is it like 25, 30 years? I feel like at this point, I mean... It's such a waste not to be utilizing this guy. Big question. Do you think these two young up-and-comers of R-Truth and Goldust are taking the opportunity, and I'm being serious about this question, that Enzo and Cass are supposed to get? Because Enzo and Cass, it seems like at this point, people know they're there, they like the intro, and that's really as far as it goes kind of at this point, right? They, they've definitely lost a lot of momentum. I feel like the, the shtick is getting old. old real quick that's the thing is with nxt you weren't you weren't seeing them every week you know you'd see them once every other week or every three weeks or so now it's it's like 
when every time it's the same intro and the promo they get like an extended paper they get an extended promo on pay-per-views but what is that what is that promo every single time at the pay-per-view what is it they're kissing the ass of whatever city they're in that and i can't unhear your damn big ass impression at some point maybe for episode 200 we got to get a sample of it at some point but ryan once this happened like two or three months ago. You did this like just off the cuff, big cast impression after the podcast, and I just died laughing. It was spot on. I don't. Yeah, now the hype's there. I don't think it's that miraculous. So if it does end up ha- does end up happening, don't expect it to be super accurate. But yeah, I think people have kind of found out the the cast and Enzo formula, and it's it gets old pretty quick. I mean. Enzo, what can they do as a tag team more than they already do with Enzo getting his ass whooped and then you tag in Big Cass for the hut tag and the promos was really where they were going to shine. But I just feel like either I appreciate I really do appreciate that Enzo is pretty creative with his promos and sometimes he's a little too creative that it's hard for the audience to kind of keep up with what he's saying. He's got you know his references can sometimes be really clever but it's like sometimes you understand why wrestling promos are so simple and direct because they're trying to get that immediate fan response they don't want you sitting there thinking about it they want you to react right away uh so i do appreciate that they try to be original sometimes but they it gets a little old when they're just kissing the city's ass over and over again nobody really cares about the pandering unless you happen to be in that live crowd at that moment and even then i tend to roll my eyes when it gets excessive I don't even know what needs to happen because I know it's easy to say, well, they're going to turn one of them against each other. Enzo is not fun to watch in the ring. He's great on the microphone. He's probably in the top five right now. So one thing is not the other. And it's kind of it's kind of incredible. You know, we talk about how how much the the mic skills and the promos and the charisma can can get you over all this wrestling terminology. You got to have something in the ring. Not a lot. You don't need a lot because Stone Cold was punches and kicks like after getting injured. You know, he needed to to improvise. But there's nothing for, for Cass. There is, uh, or, uh, there is a floor. You do need a certain amount of in-ring ability yeah. to get there. And you need to also be able to put on like believable matches where it's... Do you honestly believe that Enzo could beat anybody? Nope. It's not just at all. that's the impression we're given because... He's just this little guy who's trying to be tough and usually gets his ass whooped. So we haven't been led to believe that he's this. He we haven't been led to believe that he's someone like Rey Mysterio, where you're like, this guy is small, but he can go and he can take someone down. It's just it's not there. But I mean, it's not like he won't find a place like Enzo is way too good and way too charismatic on the microphone to not be utilized in some way. So he may end up just finding his niche as a manager or and I'll, I will leave this for the closing thought right now. He does a reverse John Cena. John Cena went from the bad, evil Dr. Thogonomics into the lovable baby face, you know, C-Nation. Enzo, flip that around. Flip that completely around. Have him become that thug type character. He can look the part. All you got to do is punches and kicks and a little bit more and more evil, you know, in you. You can you can dethrone Big Cass like you you're taking out this you know the seven I was gonna say seventy foot guy the seven foot guy down doesn't take a lot and I think that's gonna happen not yet because they probably make a lot of money but sooner or later they gotta flip that switch they did it on TJP you know and and dabbing dabbing is a thing TJP lost his last name he's TJP. just TJP now I'm just gonna call you RMM from now on so let's move on to SmackDown Live. And I can dedicate basically the rest of the podcast to this topic right now, and that's talking about the fashion file. So, uh, you know, last week it it happened, so I'm not going to act like this is a brand new thing, but I'm just happy that they did keep doing it. You know, a lot of people were afraid that it was going to be a one-time thing, but they did the uh, special London unit. I love uh, SVU (laughs) in in, uh, Law & Order, so even more things. And it's the little things. Right. Not only do they get little references like at one point, uh, Fandango said Cheerio and then Tyler Breeze said, no, no thing is I had breakfast already. That's like that's that's the lame thing I would say, which I love. Oh, yeah. No, uh, they get to keep these going. They were great, you know, investigating the the paint and then they just realize it's the ascension. Uh, It was just super entertaining. And like you said, when they presented as this comedy skit. 
then you know you're not supposed to be taking it seriously. And yeah, I'm just glad these guys are are getting time to, to show how good they really are because they're good in the ring and they're pretty funny. So what's not to love? And I mean, come on, a feud with the New Day, like that's oh man, that's what everybody's talking already, about. It, yeah, like it's right there in the making. And it's a rare occasion where we're so used to bad guys versus good guys. You can have this. This may be like a number one contender spot. Maybe the Usos and all like all the evil guys are still champions. Whoever's the champion at the time when the New Day returns, but you can have. Uh, Breezango and the New Day, you know, battle it out for number one contendership, but don't have it just be like a one-off thing. Have it be like a built-up, you know, to like a pay-per-view match. It's going to be these two teams. Who's going to come out on top and think about the character development and all of the crazy things? It's kind of crazy. We've we've always known there was this potential in Tyler Breeze and Fandango. It just took it just took Law and Order. So everybody that loves all Law and Order, thank you. 18 seasons and running for SVU. 18 seasons. Just just think of, oh, it's so good. Ryan, do you like Law & Order? <laughs> I got sucked into watching that uh, maybe a couple months ago. And Which? like, it just kept, they just kept playing episodes and there was like this three-part episode. So I was like, oh man, I'm sucked in for like another two hours. Like, Did you watch like regular Law & Order, SVU? Do you know what it was? It was SVU. It's so good. Man, they go through everything. They got to dress up. There's like sh- crappy video games they got to play. Just they go through everything. And every actor is ever there. But let's go back. We we do the wrestling thing. We we save the non-wrestling talk for the pre-show for Patreons. Let's talk a little bit about Sami Zayn. And we saw a hint of this when he was still on Raw. I think it was that segment with Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins if I'm not mistaken around like backstage. He was trying to get like the shield fist bump happening. And successfully so, they've taken annoying Sami Zayn and they've just made that a thing. And that's great. He finally has a character that you you love to hate and hate to love almost at the exact same time. They keep doing that. And I think they just got to keep at it. Like, I'm not sure where they're going to go with this long term, but I kind of like to just live in the now and the now is good. Yeah. The thing is, for everything I hear from... What other wrestlers have been saying is that this is how Sami Zayn actually is, that he's very energetic and always kind of, he just go, 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 doesn't shut up and basically keeps going until he annoys people. So I think they're just trying to play that off and and let that be shown on TV. And maybe people don't like it because, oh, we're presenting Sami in a way that's like, oh, he's annoying that people won't like him. But if they do it in the right way, it can be an endearing quality that, oh, it's, you know, he's annoying, but you got to love the guy, right? And it, it is very difficult to dislike Sami Zayn. He just looks like a friendly guy that you'd you'd want to be friends with. Uh, so, so I like it. And the best, the best wrestling characters, they always say, are someone who is themselves with the volume turned up. And that I think that's the best direction to go. If Sami Zayn's being more like himself on TV, I see nothing wrong with that. And they can play that into different storylines. You know, he talked about Kevin Owens. And the way he just mentioned it, just, you know, like off the cuff, like nobody knows Kevin Owens more than I do, just the little things. But because he's not this overly serious character, because they tried that on Raw, you know, like with Braun Strowman when he was getting his ass kicked every week. And that's cool. But if every single character in wrestling is serious, wrestling would be a very boring place. You know, thanks to guys like Joey Ryan on the independent scene, like Chuck Taylor, you know, the Young Bucks, like there's a room for all of that. Maybe it's not your cup of tea, but it's super nice when you can get a storyline with the super serious guy, the annoying guy, the supernatural guy, the guy that you don't really know what he's all about yet. You mix that up all together and and you get magic. You know, you look at the Attitude Era, The Rock, Triple H, Stone Cold, Mankind, Undertaker, Kane. I'm not even mentioning, you know, like the 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 B-roll or the C-roll guys or the rest of the DX. Each of those guys had a different different thing. You know, The Rock and Saw connection. You had your goofy, crazy, wacky guy, and you had, you know, superstardom in The Rock. You put those in together, you get magic. So that's exactly what they got to do. And I think it's going to lead to big things with Sami Zayn. If they just keep at it and they let him be himself but turned up, you know, way more, it's going to be good. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing about the Attitude Era. You can look 
at each of those top guys and say what they're all about, right? Oh, Stone Cold, the badass who doesn't care about, uh, doesn't, you know, he's against anti-authority, whatever, The Rock, he's, you know, the superstar guy, he's full of himself, he's the people's champion, Mankind's this crazy off-the-wall guy, multiple personalities, Undertaker's this dark dude, cult leader, whatever. It's like, what can you say? Oh, Seth Rollins. Seth freaking Rollins, Seth, Roman. Oh, he's freaking Seth freaking. Real, he's yeah. the architect. Okay, what has he built? Lego Treehouse. Oh, oh, he built the shield, I guess. Does, does it take an architect to have a group of three I heard, people? I heard, Ryan, he's really good at Minecraft. Don't quote me on yeah, that. And, and that's why, like, at least, like, Kevin Owens with this Face of America thing, he's taking his character somewhere. And that's why it's good for Sami Zayn that even if Sami Zayn, he's the lovable, annoying guy, at least you have something to describe about him, right? Exactly. That's what we need. You need to look, you need to have these characters and know what they're about, know their motivations, know their personalities. You know what I mean? It's, it's Star Wars, the original trilogy versus the prequels right now. Right now we get a lot of Star Wars prequels characters going around, a stoic and we don't know what the okay, hell they're, they're all about. Okay, you lost me for a second. I'm like, wait, where are you yeah. going with this? Okay, okay, okay. You got, you kind of got this me back. This is like, oh, you know what Han Solo is all about. You don't know what the hell Queen Amidala, what, what is her personality? It's nothing. She doesn't have one. Who's the Jar Jar Binks then? Oh my, whoa, whoa. Is Sami Zayn Jar Jar Binks then? <laughs> I think you just triggered a lot of people with that. <laughs> I'm in the best. Oh my god! Yeah, I just realized no, I'm not I, editing well, that. That would it's be happening. more like a Santino type character. Which do we? Who's who's the new? <laughs> is James Ellsworth? <laughs> is that? <laughs> oh my god, dude! James Ellsworth Ellsworth needs to go. He needs to go. What? Why? He, he needs the did okay. So this week on SmackDown. He he's trying to be this bad guy and like being you know you're not good when you try to get cheap heat and you're met with silence. Like that crowd did not give a I damn. I love James Ellsworth. What? I absolutely love him. I I think it's just awesome. And the fact that it, it's so cool because this is like the first time unless I'm like correct me if I'm wrong, you have a a like a women's faction with a male valet. That's true. I think that's awesome. That's so cool. It's so different. Like, I love the fact that Ellsworth is literally a part of this welcoming committee faction. And he's the one guy in the faction. That is it's really just, good. It's something really different. Like, Ellsworth is really something completely different. He's he's like the mascot. I mean, he was like that on, yeah, on Survivor I, Series. I just think but... that's really cool. And it's really original. I just think he needs acting lessons bad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. his. I think part of the reason... It like it's just kind of part of his gig is that he's he's not, like he's not his acting and his facial expressions he overacts so bad and it's like and his it's delivery terrible. is so bad it's like I, I'm yelling at you Ryan you you suck man you're terrible boo such a heel look at that heel do heel thing I imagine wow. if I ever if I ever had to be like a manager or something. I would be about as bad as James Ellsworth. <laughs> and that's, but I think that's just part of the charm of all of it. And I think it works. That's it's like not a, true. a Mike Adamley type of situation. <laughs> Ryan, that's not <laughs> it's true. It's so bad that sometimes that it could actually work. You, you'd be worse. You'd be worse. Yeah. I, I probably would be worse. Jeff Harvey. No, no, no. Let's not even go there right now. But you know where, where we are going to go? The bike club does have a chance to get some free stuff. So, you listen to this at the top of the show. We talked the last couple of weeks and on social media that we are getting more and different ways for you to be able to support us directly. Plus, you got some perks. You know, we have Patreon, but now you can get a 30 day trial of Audible. Plus, you get a free book. You can get a free audiobook, any that you want. They got over 180,000 titles. Just go to audibletrial.com slash by that. So that's B Y T E that. And you can get any book. So like right now, I actually use this and I got the AJ Lee book, The Crazy is My Superpower. It's actually narrated by herself. So it's almost like a super lengthy podcast because she's the one talking about it. And I love that she doesn't go the stereotypical way of, you know, a lot of audiobooks are trying to be monotonous about their character, about how, you know, emotions. But because it's her story, 
when it's something sad, like she really does deliver that. And sometimes it does get uncomfortable. You know, she talks about her family issues. She talks about, you know, dealing with bipolar disorder, being misdiagnosed. I haven't even gotten to the wrestling portion. And I can already tell you, like AJ Lee is the story of many people that are afraid to speak out about what's going on in their lives. And yeah, like just take advantage of the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, and I've heard that it, it's uh, it's pretty pretty heavy stuff. So I, I'm definitely gonna have to listen to it down the line. And I get a super long commute, so I'm gonna have to start getting into the audiobook world for sure. And you can do so, Ryan, I by can. going to audibletrial.com/slash bite that. And if you listen to any book in particular, let us know. We love, we love to know. And we're also gonna do our best to recommend you future titles. Plus, look forward to a, a review of AJ Lee's book once I'm done with it. But so far, it's crazy to see how much of a gamer she was. Like she talks about, you know, getting a PS1 and playing Metal Gear Solid, having a crush on Solid Snake, having a crush on Vegeta. It's so many things. Like she's two years older than we are. So just think about that, right? So she grew up liking the exact same things that we like uh, to watch and play in games and all that. So seriously, Check that book out. It is incredible, and she's become a great advocate for the world of mental health. For those that know, you know, like, I try to be my best to be an advocate of mental health, so there's so many layers as to why this book is is great. It's awesome, and seriously, do yourself a favor. Check out the audiobook. It's narrated by her, so, you know, can't, can't go wrong with that. Mojo Raleigh, Ryan, talk to me about story time with Mojo. We talked about audiobooks. AJ at least talking about her book, but Mojo... He's doing story time with kids, and they kick him and stuff. It's good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you pretty much summed it up. Is this what they're really trying? Like, this is such a step back for me of no, what they're trying to wrong. do with Mojo. This is so. Good. I'm wrong. You like this? Yes, man. I it's like I like Ellsworth. You can't stand him, and you like this garbage. I don't understand. Uh, yeah, it doesn't work for me. If you're trying to make Mojo this big deal. And you got them doing, you know, playing nice with the kids and, and doing a little tour. Like, I get that, you know, when you're outside, when you're off TV and you're you're doing all the, the charity stuff or just, you know, being a good influence for kids, I'm all for it. But if you're trying to get people to just buy into this guy as, oh, this is the next guy we want to see make it. This doesn't really work for me, telling us this is like the equivalent of when they had Roman Reigns saying Jack and the Beanstalk, right? Oh, this like, is so it much better. It doesn't work for me. I just find it hilarious. I love the combination of here's his wrestler, you know, a huge guy, just reading bed st bedtime stories. Like at some point, just read bed bedtime stories to like superstars, like to the Ascension. Like once upon a time, there was what? a little dog. Go all the way. This out is with why this. you're not allowed to write wrestling. <laughs> oh, I, I, dude, I, I, I got to. You would have Mojo Rally reading bedtime stories to the Ascension. I, think, I mean, I know the Ascension are low in the totem pole, but don't you think that would kind of kill their career? The, the only thing I'll say about me writing wrestling is that when I did do it locally, I got a sandwich over. I got a sandwich chant. It's pretty good. It's pretty good, right? Your your face is like, please, you got a please sandwich don't be chill. chant. Yes, yeah, so there, there's a, like an overweight superstar that could do a 450. Uh, I asked him to freestyle once because I needed. I edited the TV show, and uh, he sent me like a, a thing of his, him just like freestyling. And like next time, freestyle about sandwiches, about a tripleta in Puerto Rico, which like the, the even the Shining Stars had a, a move named after that. In one of the wrestling shows, a tripleta champ breaks out, and I have this smile as I'm recording. I'm like. They're chanting about a freaking sandwich because they like the wrestler only in wrestling. He really takes the credit because he was he was gold with that. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We were here to talk about Mojo Raleigh. And I think that's about as much as we should probably talk about Mojo for this week. I agree. Good. Ruru. 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 Ruru is Ruru. coming back next week. <laughs> I'm happy about it. <laughs> I, I didn't know if you were gonna say any more than that, but I guess you just gave me Ruru to work with. Yeah. So thank you, thank you for that great introduction. <laughs> yeah. So finally, I mean, if we really think about it, we were thinking how, and Juan's still just dying over there. We were thinking about how after the superstar shakeup that maybe SmackDown was 
kind of hurting a little bit uh that raw definitely got more of the more names and not only that but it's like the new day and rusev have also just straight up not been on the show so we really haven't seen the full power of smackdown live yet and i think the show's going to start clicking a lot more once all the pieces finally come together so i'm glad rusev's going to show up we know he got some sort of surgery so it's money in the bank is when he'll uh, finally be able to make it back but you know what i like that he's now going to show up to continue this storyline i wasn't a huge fan of the whole storyline to begin with but at least they're going to follow through with it while they're while while it's going so an in-ring appearance i think is huge for getting people back into getting invested in rusev because if he's going to come back in time for the build up of money in the bank now's the time to just kind of re-familiarize him with the audience get get him kind of situated on smackdown live the big question is who is Rusev? Like, what is Rusev as a character? We mentioned this when, you know, Jinder took over the main event scene. So all of a sudden, we have the anti-American guy already. But then Rusev can't just be a guy. We, we just complain about Seth Rollins, right? Where Seth Rollins was built up in the shield. He had his single stuff afterwards. And now he's just him. Are they going to do the same thing with Rusev? Because I think that as much as people know who Rusev is all about, and we all know that he's great, he's funny, he's charismatic, he's great in the ring. Don't leave it to us to make up what his character is. I would love to know, aside from a championship, because every wrestler, every superstar technically should win a title, right? They're like, maybe I'm wrong, but I think all of them aspire to be champions. What else? If you become a champion, what does that show look like? I don't know. He should be the artist known as Rusev, right? Oh, yeah. That'd be a good gimmick. Yeah, he just needs he needs something that isn't foreign heel because now gender has occupied that space that is his to run with so it's time for a new story with rusev no more leaning on the anti-american stuff if you're gonna be a heel be a heel for a different reason and it, whether it's just he wants to you know he could just have the kind of a character like pre-rated our superstar edge of his obsession with becoming the world champion or wwe champion for that matter and it looks like that could be the direction they're going because he's basically saying i'm not coming back unless i get a title shot at money in the bank and they should just run with that i mean the dude has been on the roster for a couple of years now he has you know he's had his ups and downs but he's really established himself as a guy who can definitely go and is super entertaining, can be pretty damn funny, and SmackDown Live is the perfect place for them to nurture that into a main eventer. So he needs to start, you know, getting in the a spot of, you know, going for the title. He needs to have a few more championship matches, and then maybe you're off to the races. And the big question is always still, what's going to happen with Lana? They keep doing that build up. They're going to be completely separate. It looks like. But it's, They're on it's the same feels, brand, but completely yeah. separate. And it's weird, right? Like, neither of them are on the show, but both are being built up for appearances. At some point, I just want something to happen, like a little thing. We, you know, we talked about the Kurt Angle thing, so I think it'd be hypocritical if you know we're critical about that with the GMs. we got to be critical about this because we know they're a real-life couple. We spent months on a terrible storyline with Summer Rae and everybody else, so at least give us some kind of closure. Like they're going to be on the same show. If they were in separate Don't shows. Don't count on it. Let me dream, man. But I mean, look at look at Naomi and uh, is it Jimmy Uso? I guess I'm pretty sure it's Jimmy Uso. Let's hope so. Yeah, so you look at them. Everyone knows they're a couple, but they just they're on the same show and they're kept separate. But their characters are not about being a couple, as opposed to Rusev and Lana. It's true. Work. So but that's now different. that's why they've both gone away for a while. And you know, if, hey, if you leave and you come back. You get to start completely new and everyone forgets everything that happened. Or, or at least that's what WWE really wants you to think. Bring it to the table. Let's end the show talking about a show. A show that we were very critical of when it first happened. I think that first episode is never well, going to leave my I was the only one that liked it. Yeah. But e even then, I think it was just traumatizing, that, that first episode. We've had a couple now. This was the fourth episode with... Peter Rosenberg, Corey Graves, and JBL. We watched it. Uh, I watched it just before we hit the record button. I know you saw it a, a little bit earlier there. 
and they talked about a lot of topics. You know, they they spoke about the welcoming committee, and I I like I think they're finally getting a really nice format where Peter Rosenberg. I'm not gonna say he's the fan, but he brings up things that maybe wouldn't get brought up. Corey Graves, even though he's an insider in WWE because he's a commentator, he sort of is a little bit more honest. Like when he talked about the welcoming committee, I really appreciated how he went. It's just three superstars piled up together with different personalities. Like it didn't really blend. But then you have JBL basically selling you the network. Like JBL's purpose in that show is I love WWE and I'm going to die until, you know, like until the last day that I'm here, I am going to defend anything that happens in the company. And I think that's fine in a show like this where it's like quick fire. They don't have a lot of time to analyze. They have a lot of topics to get to. I like it, and I'm just happy that it's it's a thing. Yes, JBL, I know. He, he even is very much JBL, like the bully type guy in this, but it is, I, I don't want to say it is what it is, but it is what it is, unfortunately, until any more stuff comes out. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, he he's going to stay at the company, and at least, at the very least, there is there are eyes on JBL now. The attention is on him. So he's obviously going to have to be on his best behavior. So at the very least, that has happened. Yeah, bring it to the table. I think it's a show that maybe it's trying a little too hard to be like sports centery with like the whole slider thing and switching topics so quickly. I really like I like that they kind of go into sort of a kayfabe, non kayfabe kind of discussion of the topics. My issue is that they just, they never get, it's so surface level, never gets deep enough. You get like one sentence on how you feel. I would rather there be like three topics maybe, and they spend, you know, 10, five minutes on each one. There's no back and, and forth. Of, yeah, there's a little more back and forth. Now it's one person says their point, another person says their point, and we move on. There's no, there's no debate or anything like that. And maybe that's not what they're going for. But if they just got a little bit deeper, I think it would be a much better show. But it's just so rapid fire. Yeah, I think that like the big issue there is that because GBL defends WWE almost to like a blind point in the show. And, and once again, that is his purpose there. He's talking about characters in the show, but he's a character himself because there's no back and forth. Corey Graves looks kind of weird because he's like super realistic, you know, in your face about what he likes and doesn't like. But then because he doesn't have time to respond to GBL, it's this awkward thing. If we disagree, but we're just going to leave it there. We don't really have time to cover it. But I still applaud WWE for doing shows like this where I do think this has a format. I think this has a place. I still believe that if it were not for the Dean Ambrose interview, we'd still have more podcasts than we would shows like Bring It to the Table because the podcasts are gone. Like, isn't that insane how the podcasts and the network were a big deal? Like, for a while, they promoted that as, like, you get the network, is you get these exclusive interviews. And now it's just, here's Peter Rosenberg. Here's, you know, a table for three. We're bringing that back. We never got that Undertaker interview. We never got it, man. We never got never. it, man. Well, yeah, I mean, those Stone Cold podcasts, they really... They peaked way too early. They were like, boom, Vince McMahon, boom, Triple H, and then it really fell off after that. They really did, but uh, we would love to get your feedback. Do you like Bring It to the Table? If not, what kind of discussion or, or round table that it's maybe table for three, what kind of discussion content do you like in the network or would you like to see there? You know, they, they need to bring back Legends of Wrestling, was, man. Yeah, Legends of Wrestling was awesome. And Legends with JBL. Seriously, I know JBL, there's a lot of questionable stuff, but that show was excellent from the way that he presented it, from the way that he brought up the questions. He was able to get the same information we may have heard in the past, but in a new angle, in a different way, and it was professional. It didn't feel like, hey, we have another show. It felt, this is a big deal. You could put this show, like the Ron Simmons episode, you can put that up on ESPN. You can put that up somewhere and there's substance to it that maybe we don't get that much on other shows that seem a little bit too scripted for my liking. So gang, remember, we talk about Raw, we talk about SmackDown, we talk about pay-per-views. We got TakeOver happening. We may be doing a review about that. I don't know. Could happen. Only time will tell. But you can send us questions every single week. Bite that cast at gmail.com. You can also hit us up on Twitter, bite that cast, and use the hashtag AskBT Ryan. At this point, you've got to learn to accept. If Keith is not here, 
you're our honorary Canadian for the episode. And every time I always Come remember, at the, once I see the questions, I'm like, oh, yeah, I have to read these. We've every done almost 200 episodes of these, man. So I'll, I guess I'll just get right into it. Our first question comes from Tyler at TJ Kinder, and he asks, who would you rather see or what would you rather see AJ versus Brock or Balor versus Brock? To me, AJ feels like he could take on Brock, win, and feel like it's legitimate. I know I may get some hate for this. I like Finn Balor. Finn Balor is cool. Finn Balor is sexy, and I wish I had his abs. As a fully heterosexual man, I can say he is a beautiful man, and I am very envious of the way he pulls off that damn leather jacket, and I wish I could look half as good as he does. Rant over. AJ Styles. AJ is... like, <laughs> you, know, you know how AJ is so damn good... He came out on SmackDown, and there was just an AJ Styles chant. They weren't cheering him. He wasn't even getting cheered. They were just chanting his name. He's got everybody in the palm of his hands, and every match that he is in feels special. I'd like to see both matches, but if I'm only choosing one, I'm definitely choosing AJ Styles. That seems like a dream match, and I mean, the story tells itself. And, you know, AJ's going to work his ass off. Both of these guys will work their, their asses off and, and have a hell of a match. But as far as, like, main roster credibility right now, AJ definitely seems like he'd be in a more prime position for that matchup. So thank you for the question. Our next question f comes from Snipin Sexton, classic Sexton Hardcastle. In honor of WWE, whoa, let me start over. You can in do honor it. of WWE in London this week, and there's something I can't read in another language. I don't, I don't know what it says. Uh, oh my God, it's wow, not even really? another language. Dude, I God, am oh dumb. My, wow, I am dumb. Okay, I'm taking over this question, <laughs> Ryan. Ryan, you can take a break from here. No, hold on. Let me do this. I will tell you what I thought was another language, but it was just phonetic spelling. It was in honor of WWE in London this week. Hello, governor. I thought that was another language. I'm dumb. This is why I don't read questions, folks. This week, I want to know if Keith would have got that. I don't think he would have got it either. He would have. This week, I want to know your favorite single entrance. Not your run-of-the-mill everyday ones, but special ones. For example, my favorite single entrance ever is Randy Orton at SummerSlam 2005. Old theme song, Pose... Giant wall of cascading pyro equals best ever. Other examples could include, but are not limited to, Rusev's tank, any Undertaker mania entrance, or perhaps even Ricardo Rodriguez's rumble entrance. What do you guys think? Keep up the great work. I like simplicity with a little bit of uh, variety. And when I read this, I immediately thought of Shawn Michaels' entrance at, I think, was WrestleMania 25. That was... That was like when he came out like the White Knight when he took on Undertaker. Yeah. That was WrestleMania 25, right? I think so. I, uh, I will say I'm a yes. I will, I will was say not, yes. I wasn't really watching during that time, so I'm iffy on... Like, it's harder for me to remember the numbers during the, those years. But I like the simplicity that, you know, Undertaker usually comes up, you know, from the ground. He is, you know, the, the dark phenom, the Undertaker, the dead man. So here comes Shawn Michaels... You know, rising, uh, like going down from the heavens to take down this evil human being. And then he just starts like, you know, the, the Shawn Michaels entrance. He goes from like this glorious, holy entrance to just the Shawn Michaels thing. And I love the contrast where it's like, you know what you're going about here? It's light versus dark. The entrance goes directly with what's happening in the storyline and what's happening in the match. Did the match deliver? <laughs> yes. You don't need to question whether that match delivered or not. So the the entrance made that match mean that much more. And I really liked it, even though it was simple. Yeah, there's a ton of great Undertaker ones. The one at 29 with all the hands like grabbing. Zombies. Like the, yeah, the zombie hands or whatever. I love the New Day's entrance at 32 because the fact that we saw Dragon Ball Z Saiyan armor on a WrestleMania is just the most amazing thing ever. So that that just for that alone, that's that's at the top of my list. I'm trying to remember some like super cool. It's always the Undertaker. I think of like the Druids and stuff that they did multiple years, like WrestleMania 20. I mean Triple H is. I didn't really like a lot of Triple H. Seems like 
he's like too over the top now that I oh, honestly yeah. am not like a fan. Like, oh, you got. I didn't think the motorcycle thing was cool. I didn't think Terminator thing was cool. Would you count entrances with live performances like The Undertaker uh, had, you know, like Roland, like Limp Biscuit? I mean, Undertaker, even then it goes back to The Undertaker, yeah, crazily enough. It's true. Uh, I don't know if that would be my favorite. I did. I think the Bray Wyatt live performance entrance was pretty cool. That is true. It was a little out there. Rey Mysterio had P.O.D. play him out. I, I forget which WrestleMania that was now when they played that Buyukao Buyukao theme song. So it was, it was probably that as well. 22 when he won. Yeah, that, sound, that sounds about right. 21 or 22. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, uh, a lot of cool ones. I know there's so many more I'm forgetting that are just awesome but i mean i've, I've never been to f- cena's were always kind of like what happened oh eh. like the bunch of john cena's as he ran down the ramp what did you think of that i don't even know if i saw that one really that, i might have missed oh yeah. you gotta watch that so basically imagine an army of cena's literally all dressed as cena they all like are you know uh, uh to the sides of the ramp and everybody's doing the this you is can't like see the real pro- slim pose. shady or something trying to trying to yeah i guess channel eminem he stood yeah, up i just remember cena had like the chicago gangster entrance one where cm punk was one of the the gangsters or whatever way back when or when he had that car that he drove through like the glass yeah, that was good. Yeah, those are the only ones I remember. I, I wasn't a huge fan of those, but yeah, I, I'd go with the New Day one or the plethora of cool Undertaker ones. So thank you for the question. Our next question comes from Irish T. I would like to throw an idea at you for Money in the Bank pay-per-views. Do you think WWE should use TNA's old Feast or Fired match for lower card guys on both SmackDown and Raw, where if you're fired, you go down to NXT for a specific amount of time. I know in the past you guys have said this is a dumb match, but I think WWE could make it a bit more interesting and can use lower card guys that have never, that are never used. Thanks. Have a great one. I think the the Feast for Fire match, in in theory, it's cool. Where you can win but still lose. Like you can win a match but get fired, right? You can win a match and get a tag title opportunity, which okay, but maybe you don't have a tag partner. You have to really adapt your career based on that outcome. But I was never a fan of the fact that you literally had somebody get fired. Like just, hey, you're gone. But there is something to like maybe WWE doing something where you're actually getting quote unquote demoted to NXT, but at the same time, that makes NXT look bad. Because NXT is supposed to be the third brand, right? So how do you justify yeah. going, you're going down to NXT. It should kind of be like, no, man. NXT is the place to be. Drew, Ga- Drew McIntyre now again technically is an NXT on his own terms. He preferred to be there as opposed to in the main roster. So it would be cool if there was a thing where you win a match and you get to choose a briefcase and you get to go to either you know stay on your show you get to go to SmackDown or you get to go to NXT or maybe you get to go to like a UK show or something. So they treat them as equals, but you at least get to pick your future in like a draft. So incorporate it into like a supplementary supplemental draft or, or the whole draft itself. Something to keep that interesting as opposed to just Ryan's the GM. He chooses Finn Balor. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the Feast or Fired concept just because I think it was really kind of crappy what TNA did sometimes with the whole firing thing. And I completely agree with one where if this guy gets demoted to NXT and then he beats people in NXT, what does that make them look like? Um, I liked in the early NXT days when guys like Cesaro would just go to NXT because they wanted to. Maybe, you know, um, Tyson Kidd at the time wasn't doing anything, goes down to NXT, reinvents himself, comes back to the main roster, wins the tag titles. Like, that was the cool thing about NXT. People went down there because they wanted to, not because they're forced to, and it it just ends up making everything look bad. However, I think it would be cool if they did do some sort of lower card thing at Money in the Bank where you did get some sort of cash in type thing like whether it's oh if you want to move like something that's that is like the money in the bank bank briefcase when you can choose when you want to use it so if they want to like switch brands or they have this sort of like get out of jail free card for whatever purpose you know it, it would be interesting to have something like that used so i'd like to see something for the lower card guys to use and and give them something to do that could be fun like that or just play monopoly 
Yeah, it's true. So thank you for the question. Our ne- our next question comes from Benjamin R. Asking, hey guys, so if I remember correctly, you mentioned multiple times in the past, po- uh, multiple times in the past podcast that you like Star Wars movies, and you also like to play video games occasionally. So here's my question. Have you played some of the various Star Wars video games? If so, which Star Wars games? Keith needs to be yeah. here for this question. We, we, I, uh, this he may says, be a question I personally we can that. recommend Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. If you have never played it, it is a Bioware RPG similar to Mass Effect and Dragon Age, which is set in the Star Wars universe. I really adore this game, and I think Star Wars, Star Wars fans should check it out. Thanks for the great podcast work. Keep that up and have a nice week thank you we're gonna have to also follow up with keith because this question is practically made for him yes funnily enough uh knights of the old republic to me is the equivalent of the smackdown games for wrestling like i i like the star wars movies i've watched all of them and i've enjoyed them i'm not gonna say i i I understand the lore of everything but i never got star wars until i played that game for the original xbox i love the world i love the gameplay uh, I was a big fan of RPGs at that time, so it was like perfect, you know, the really good combination. So I was a really big fan of that. I also loved playing the Star Wars, the the arcade game with like the flight stick. That was so damn enjoyable. I played the Dark Forces, I believe that was on PC, like way back in the day. I played the PS1 version. I played Super Empire Strikes Back for the Super Nintendo. That was that was freaking hard. And yeah, like I, I played the. I may Indiana have Jones that one. game on Super Nintendo that friend. was like made by the same people. Yeah. Um, yeah, Star Wars games, I actually have not played a ton of them. I, I did play some of like the Jedi games on like PS1. Like I had a demo of it and then I, I played finally some one of my friends had that game. I forget which one, uh, but it was based on like the prequels. So eh. oh, I played Star uh, Wars The Force Unleashed. I do have Knights of the Old Republic on Steam, but I've not played through it yet. I played maybe the first five minutes of it and haven't done anything. So you since. got to the menu is what you're saying. Uh, yeah, I got to like that. You're on that like ship at the beginning and I got maybe to the end of that. But other than that, I haven't really done anything. So I will have to go through that at some point because uh, I am a fan of Star Wars. I still haven't seen Rogue One either. So my my Star Wars game is a little weak. I love that combination. I love Star Wars. Haven't seen Rogue One. You got to watch Rogue One. That, that yeah, to me was I better. I like Star Wars. I am not a, I'm not a Star Wars mark, I guess you could say. I just enjoy it. I'm not super, super into it. By the way, I do have a, a video game channel, vid.me slash epicjc. Cheap plug is over. Ryan, keep, keep going. Ryan. So thank you for the question. Yes. Our next question comes from TMAK, uh, TMK Tanner, staying with the non-wrestling questions. He says, what's for dinner? Not a chicken dinner. I actually, well, damn it. No, actually, no, I did have a chicken dinner. I had six chicken dumplings because I wasn't that hungry. I had some coffee. <laughs> Ryan, what, what's your answer? What's for dinner? So I still haven't had dinner yet, but it's probably going to be either uh, like chicken fingers or chicken and rice, depending on which one I want to cook. We love our chicken, man. Yeah. What's your favorite? Have that chicken. What is your favorite chicken dish? Like I, I, I'm a big fan of chicken cordon bleu. Like you know, with that cheese melted in the middle, so good. Uh, I love chicken parm, even though it seemed to destroy me at our uh, WrestleMania oh weekend. My God, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I do love me some chicken parm. I know you do. Bathroom knows <laughs> it as well. So thank you for the question. Our uh, final question comes from Cynical Just, uh, Cynical Justin. Man, I can't talk today. At Cynical Cypher. Check out his YouTube channel. And he's also on VidMe as well. He says, what are some little known facts about yourselves? Little known facts. So I love public speaking. So that, that I guess that's something I can... I don't know if you guys can tell. I like talking a lot. So like last week, uh, I spoke in 24 hours across national television technically uh, talking about mental health so like outside of the podcast i run support groups for for people with a substance compulsive disorder that suffer from depression i work in mental health here in puerto rico uh i have worked at the national level at the local level and love doing it uh because like much like ag lee 
Uh, I suffer from a variety of mental health conditions. I actually have three, count them, three suicidal attempts in my life. I show that I overcame it. A lot of people talk about suicide and this very like suicide and this and that. Dude, you know, if, if you have depression, if you have something, the best way to deal with it is to not deal with it. Like keep your life busy. Like this podcast right here. Like, you know, and this is what we're like behind the scenes. I've been going through some stuff lately, some changes that have been really hard for me. And this podcast for me is therapy. Like a, a lot of shitty days, because I got to say it, man. I do this podcast and it goes away. Who needs the medication? So if anybody wants me to talk about mental health, obviously this is not a podcast topic, but I can talk about that on uh, Twitter. You can follow me up at JC or, or Bite That Cast. So I guess that's like a really heavy answer to this question that maybe yeah. cynical, maybe cynical wasn't cynical enough with his question, but hey, felt like it, it was a good opportunity. Some little known facts. I don't know if there's anything that's like super interesting <clears throat> other than like what? <clears throat> what? Award winning actor. <clears throat> oh yeah, maybe that I have happened to be in a little. There was a a forty eight hour film contest. Thing that I was helping my sister and her friends out with. Uh, they they have like a studio. They film like educational uh, films or whatever. And but for fun in the springtime. In fact, it's actually probably coming up in a couple of weeks. Is they do a thing called the forty eight hour film contest, where you have to uh, you have to make an entire movie beginning to end. Like you get the topic, the theme, like the genre it has to be they all give that to you on that friday and you have the whole weekend to make an entire movie from that concept and to uh to then turn in by the end of the weekend as a full like it has to be at least a, like four minutes long or something like that so you make a short film so a couple years ago i end up helping out just expecting to you know whatever help with some cameras or equipment or whatever the hell end up having to be one of the lead actors oh, and there's yeah. heavy quotations such acting actors in this film so if you want to go over what youtube the search list? attack of the landfish you can watch my amazing acting in what is uh, an award winning movie guess what it didn't win awards for acting that's for sure but it did win for special effects and stuff cuz there was some uh, Pretty good effects made in such a short span of time. That being said, that so closing scene, man, you're you're face it at the end. You're going like, ah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's cringy. It's great. You know? it, it is it is the perfect amount of cringe for a man that hates to cringe. So that's it's not bad at all, man. And uh, yeah, I guess the only yeah. other thing is that I refereed a couple shows, and I refereed this show. That actually had John Cena's dad doing commentary. But anyway, as far as kayfabe of that league goes, I, it was like the opening match. I was refing it. I took a springboard drop kick, which I knew ahead of time I was going to get. And then like I had to sell it like I was dead or whatever. They carry me out and I never refereed for them again. So in that <laughs> kayfabe, it was just like I died from that <laughs> missile drop kick. It's on YouTube somewhere. It's like Atlantic Pro Wrestling from like I didn't know that. 20- it's like from 2013 or 2014 or something. You got some homework, Ryan. I want to see yeah. that dropkick. Oh, I, I I should be able to find it. If I find it, I'll tweet it out. Oh, man. I cannot wait to see that. I've, I've seen some of the wrestling. Because, like, you backyard wrestled for a while as well. Oh, yeah. 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 About that. Yeah. So, folks. I backyard wrestled for a little while. I did <laughs> two matches for an indie show that is, like, as indie as you could get. So, and I was not good, but, but uh, hey, at least I could say I was in the ring. I took some bumps, whatever. So you guys listen and, to Ryan yeah. and people, you act like Ryan is the most normal one of the bunch. I, I know who you are. Ryan is a former WWE possible no. superstar. <laughs> <laughs> no. We talk about but James hey, Ellsworth. You know, Here's something worse. But hey, uh, if, what's his name? It's like AJ Green. I think he goes by um, – I think that's what he's go by is in wrestling or whatever. But he he's doing a lot of indie shows in the New England area or whatever. And he was like uh, probably like in middle school, early high school when he was like training with us. 
and he didn't really want to do it at first, but then he like got super into it, and now he's off doing indies. He's he uh, he had when the Bella Twins weren't in WWE, they were like his valet for a match or whatever. Damn, like he's actually he's a uh, he's become a uh, pretty reputable guy. So it's cool to see someone who is training with us actually out there still doing it. You deserve it. Triggered. So <laughs> thank you guys for uh, for listening to another edition of the Bite that podcast so as always to close out the show we got the bt weekly packed update. update packed packed update Ooh. so uh as one mentioned before we got the audible trial so if you guys want to try out audible for 30 days get yourself a free audio book including tons of wrestling books i know daniel bryan's books on there aj lee's book which uh want to mention earlier you can go to audibletrial.com slash bite that We've been uh, promoting our friends at WrestleThon. They're going to be doing their 48-hour stream May 19th. It's happening again. May 19th to the 21st. That's over at twitch.tv slash WrestleThon. And that's going to be for the Child's Play Charity. Uh, uh, yes, Child's Play Charity. A new t-shirt's out. More Woo! Bite That merchandise. If you head over to whatamaneuver.net, you can search for Bite That. We have a new BT ring logo. If you've seen on Twitter, our icon, it is that graphic, the BT with the inside the ring. Pretty awesome stuff. I believe we also got sweatshirts and tank tops. Yeah, available. we got some baby tees in there. You got babies. Baby tees. Babies, man, for the babies. We do it for the babies. Babies. <laughs> anyway, babies. Uh, so... Of course, Patreon. Best way to support us, head over to patreon.com slash bite that. For as little as a dollar, you can uh, get access to behind-the-scenes info of what we're doing next, as well as a Ron uncut video version of the podcast. Our, our, our gold patrons also get early access to videos, including this week they're going to get early access to our WrestleMania trip video, which uh, they can watch right now. Gold patrons can watch that right now. That'll be up this weekend for everyone else. We talk about uh, just the fun experience of all of us at WrestleMania. The first time all three of us are together in the same place and just how awesome that trip was. It's almost like an hour long podcast. 50 minute, 50 yeah, minute video. It's basically with a whole separate podcast of us just talking about talking about the trip. And so it was with a fun pictures, time. Though. With pictures, including pictures. the one with Virgil. Oh. How could we forget that moment? That's actually the thumbnail. Yep. Because uh, it had to be. What else would have been the thumbnail? Wanted to Photoshop Keith in there. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Like this podcast, Keith wasn't there. So road to episode 200. We're what? We're six weeks away. Ooh. Six weeks. We're going to point to the 200 WrestleMania sign. The Vitamania 200. So we're going to be doing a giveaway, which we're going to be announcing next week. So stay tuned for those details. And uh, we want to let you guys know we want episode 200 to be special. So if you want, if you have suggestions for how we can make episode 200 special, send us a tweet, send us an email. We appreciate that. And lastly, whatever device you're listening to us on, whether it's iTunes or Stitcher or any other podcast platform, Make sure to subscribe and to rate us five stars. Any any reviews like that will help out a ton. It helps people when they search for wrestling podcasts. It helps bite that show up in the search. So we really appreciate any of that and all those reviews. Thank you guys for listening. I'll finally let you guys know. Uh, let you guys go. We will. <laughs> you let <laughs> we'll them know. You, you let them know. So now we will let them know that you can go because the show has concluded and there's nothing else there rhymes with that goodbye that means go go bye bye, <laughs> bye. <laughs>